is an honor to allow me to come and speak to you today, and, I, and I'm grateful for this opportunity. I have to admit, I've been a little nervous and scared, as my family can attest, but um, I don't know where you are in your life right now, but, and we're all at different stages in our life. In 1997, I was sitting where you are as a stay-at-home mom of four children, and um, just needed to move on in my life because I knew that I needed to move forward. Um, I'm currently, as Jennifer mentioned, the lead senior recruiter for Rocky Mountain Power, which is the parent, and the parent company is Pacific Corps. And you'll see a little yellow sign on it says Pacific Corp. That's the company that I hire for. Um, and so Pacific Corp actually owns Rocky Mountain Power. So I hire for all of our uh, delivery personnel here in Utah, Idaho, and Wyoming, as well as all of our generation facilities in Wyoming, southern Utah, and Idaho, and we have a, a gas plant in Chehalis, Washington as well. We also have hydro, wind, and solar uh, panels uh, that we generate power with as well. And But mainly our power right now is coming from coal, gas, and a geothermal plant down in southern Utah. Um, and so I'm able to have a hand in changing people's lives and helping them find great careers. And what an opportunity that is for me to do that. Um, I serve on Salt Lake Community College's Business Schools PAC Committee, as Jennifer had mentioned. I am also on the Department of Workforce Services Executive Advisory Board for the Wasatch Front and Tooele County. I've been asked to share with you my journey. And we all have our own journey, we all have our own story. And so today I'm gonna to share with you mine. It gets a little personal, but sometimes we like that. So I hope sharing this with you today will help inspire you a bit and uh, let you know that you will make it and you will succeed. Um, since this is a learning environment, please feel free to stop me anytime and ask a question if you have one, okay? Just raise your hand high enough so I can see you. Um, okay, so my personal journey starts back as a really quite shy little beach girl in Los Angeles, California. I was a child to a teenage mother who did her best to raise two girls in the 60s. Uh, we lived on the welfare system in California. It was a very small, um, just the three of us, and we tried to survive day by day. And I quickly learned that being on welfare can be quite depressing. And it tends to suppress those who rely on it for too long during their lives. And I always had a deep down desire to do something different. I just didn't know how. Um, and I had been in many foster homes that I lived in that had offered some suggestions and I could see opportunities, but I still just didn't know quite how to get there. So bouncing from foster homes and living for a period of time with the Hells Angels group, um, and then living in motels and various ways just to daily survive with a mother who was a teenager. And um, through that period of time, uh, there was a lot of growth. There was a lot of becoming mom myself and just trying to survive on a daily basis. When I graduated high school, it was an accomplishment. No one I know in my family had ever graduated high school. Um, I was 17, I was still living in a foster home, I was a ward of the state. But when I turned 18, I was determined to stop the cycle. Um, I didn't want to be a statistic relying on welfare, and quite frankly, that's what the welfare system does. As soon as you turn 18, they send you the form, sign up, we'll put you on welfare, and away we go. And I, I refused. And the family I was living with at that time said, well, then if you're going to refuse, you're going to have to pay rent. So I did. So I went out and found myself a job and was determined to um, get a job and, and make my own way. Kind of hard when you're that young and not family to draw upon, but um, during my, that time frame, um, I figured that my out was the military. So I had heard that you could get a great education through the military. So I was Air Force bound. 
And that was my goal. And um, so as I went to apply, they realized I was 17 and I couldn't apply at that time, so I had to wait until <laughs> I was 18. And so when I did turn 18, um, I had decided to do a little bit of school, get some experience under my belt with schooling, and um, entered a junior college in Orange County, California. There's where I met um, my husband. And well, there went the military idea. And uh, since he wanted to go to medical school, my whole determination was kind of refocused. I really wanted an education. I had learned that that's the way that you make it in the world, is getting a formal education. But I wanted to focus on him and allowing him that opportunity to get an education. So I went to school full time. Um, I mean, went to work full time. And then school brought us here to Utah, which is how we transplanted here to Utah. My husband graduated from the University of Utah in uh, biology and microbiology. And um, at that time, I had the opportunity to stay home with three young boys at the time. And um, so I thought, OK, this is great. This is what you're supposed to do in life. I'm, I'm, I'm all on an OK path. And then all of a sudden, the shock of our lives came. We had a premature daughter who required round-the-clock care, oxygen, monitors, and medication. And it was a trying time in our lives watching this two-pound baby trying to survive and know that she was totally your responsibility. So grateful we were for this two-pound baby, but scared to death with the overwhelming responsibility. When she was finally old enough to go to school all day, that was my opportunity. And that's when I called Salt Lake Community College and said, how do I do this? I'm a mom, I'm too old, and, but can I do this? And absolutely, you would be considered a non-traditional student. So I entered Salt Lake Community College, and the first class I walk into, I walk into a class like this, and I sit down, and everybody's staring at me. And I thought, what's wrong? And they said, aren't you the teacher? And I said, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm just coming back to school. And um, they, why are you coming back to school? And they wanted to know. And I said, well, quite frankly, I want to go back into the workforce, but I, can't, I don't even know how to turn on a computer, to be honest with you and uh, didn't know what email was. This was just in 97, so not too long ago. But um, anyway, so I was determined this time, though, to finish my associate's degree. Through many nights of doing homework with our children, um, I would sit down with them, do their homework, put them to bed, and then I'd start on mine late in the evening and go through the night. Um, it all paid off. I succeeded and received my associate's degree in business management. And during my three years at Salt Lake Community College, I had a great mentor, and some of you may know him, Curtis Youngman. Uh, so Professor Youngman uh, was a mentor of mine, kind of took me under his wing, as he does with so many hundreds of students. And uh, he graciously introduced me into Delta Epsilon Chi. I thought, I'm too old, I'm a mother, I can't be doing this stuff. But Delta Epsilon Chi then is what we now call DECA. Any of you hear of DECA before? Okay, anybody in DECA? All right, you need to check it out because <laughs> even though I was a non-traditional student, I had four children and a husband at home, it gave me great confidence and strength within myself to do a lot of what I do today, and one of which is to speak in front of you right now. Um, it was very difficult for me to get in front of a crowd and speak, and DECA kind of forced me to do that. And um, later on, I became president of DECA in my third year, which gave me a scholarship. And so I never thought I'd have a scholarship. Wow, here I am, a mom, and I got a scholarship. I was tickled. That was awesome. After graduation, I landed a few jobs in the HR arena. And within a few years, I found a great position to boost my career in human resources with a staffing company called Manpower. Anybody hear of Manpower before? And so it's a, it's a great opportunity for you to, um, if you're looking for work, to get fast work. But as I was on the flip side, I worked for Manpower as a staffing specialist. That's where I did hundreds of interviews constantly. I'd probably do close to 30 a day. 
and I did that for about seven years. Um, I also had the opportunity through this company to get out and meet with just about every type of industry there is in the Salt Lake area and walk through their doors, meet with their HR managers, go out onto the floor, learn what they do, learn certain machinery from industrial to technical to administrative and even executive type positions, I was able to fill for them. It was a great training ground for me to uh, go into human resources. Um, I loved learning about all those various industries and helping people achieve their dreams. And sometimes it was moms just like me, or maybe it was people coming right out of high school. Some were um, young men or women getting ready to go on a mission and just wanted to gain some experience and, and work a little bit before. Uh, sometimes it was students, and it was just a wide variety of people that I was able to help and train and get them up and running themselves into the workforce. Within a few years um, after that, I was recruited and offered a position with Rocky Mountain Power. I actually turned it down the first time because I was really content with manpower. I loved what I did. I loved the people I was helping. And I believed in it. And I had passion for it. And so that passion led me to understand and look at myself and, and look at what would be best for me and my family. And uh, so about two weeks later, I got another call from Rocky Mountain Power and said, let's just have an interview. And I thought, OK. So I had an interview in my car, in the parking lot, with the HR director of Pacific Warp Rocky Mountain Power, who was in Portland. And I'm sitting in my car having this interview, thinking, what am I doing? <laughs> I'm having this interview. But it went very well, and he offered me the job right there. And um, it was something that I just wasn't sure of. But in that interim, I had time to research the company and research their values and understand that I would be taking another step to help people in their careers and not only help them, but help keep the lights on. If I could only tell you how many linemen I've hired to keep these lights on right now, it would, it's astounding. And I feel very proud of that. Um, within a few years, after reading resume after resume after resume and requiring on those resumes a bachelor's degree, guess what I didn't have? a bachelor's degree. So after going through that period of time of wanting that and thinking, geez, I've got the experience and I've got the associate's degree to qualify for this job, but personally, I wasn't satisfied yet. So that led to another determination to get a bachelor's degree. And with the help of tuition reimbursement through Rocky Mountain Power, I was able to once again uh, moved towards improving myself. I registered with Western Governors University and what turned out to be some of the hardest four years of my life. Um, not only did I work a full-time job that required a lot of traveling, I also had four teenagers at home, and if any of you know what that's like, maybe you were one yourself, and raising four teenagers at the same time and then doing their homework with them and then at night doing my own homework, sometimes till two or three in the morning, or on a plane, or in my hotel room. Actually, that was great, because I had no interruptions in a hotel room, and they all had Wi-Fi, uh, which is, you know, the Western Governors is an online university. So, but again, I succeeded. I obtained my Bachelor's of Science degree in HR management, and at the same time, received my PHR certification, which is a professional human resource certification. I then became the lead senior recruiter for Pacific Corp, also known as Rocky Mountain Power, and I am loving it. The opportunities it provides me, such as today, standing before you, who I would have never have thought back in 97 that I would, where I was sitting, that I would be standing here today. I remember listening to lectures and thinking, what did they do in their life to get to where they are today? Well, you just heard some of mine and you have your own stories as well. Um, so before I go on, I, I wanted to share some personal tips of success. I'm gonna share some tips with you. You can take them, you can leave them. They're my own personal suggestions. And then after that, we'll go into um, helping you a little bit with some ideas 
for resumes or interviews or any other questions you may have about finding that perfect career or that first step into a great uh, job. The first tip I have is to learn and practice ethics in the workplace. And I want to let that sit in your brain for a minute. So ethics in the workplace is basically moral principles, standards of behavior, or a set of values regarding proper conduct in the workplace. You would benefit yourself to know proper workplace eth ethics and even practice them in your personal life. The number one reason for terminations that I have seen in every company I've worked in, and in being HR, you learn about the sadness of you know, forced terminations. And one of the number one reasons is plain and simple, they did not follow or observe ethics in the workplace. And it's a sad thing to see when it's something so simple to learn and observe. Even a simple joke that you learned uh, somewhere, just sharing it with someone else at work, could get you fired, plain and simple. It's, it's a form of harassment. And so you want to be very careful that when you do get hired, you follow and look at the company's code of conduct. You follow their ethics in their workplace. And I understand they have a class here even that offers it. So there's things out on the web and so much information about um, handling yourself and, and proper behavior in the workplace. And I would say that is probably one of our number one problems today. And it's young and old. It's, it's all ages that uh, we have to work on this with. Next one is always keep setting goals. And know what you want and go after it. And when the time presents itself, go for it. And if you think the time is right to go for that goal, you better take, take that opportunity. Every New Year's Eve, I, I kind of set this own goal, every New Year's Eve with my children, we have a goal-setting night. We make this fabulous dinner. My husband is a wonderful chef, and we serve anything they want, from king crab to um, prime rib to, I mean, we just do a great dinner for our kids. But I have one caveat, that they have to stay there and set three goals. And I plaster those goals on the fridge. And so every month they are seeing these goals. And it's been awesome to watch them achieve these goals and see how their lives have progressed from that. Next is to be flexible. First of all, we all know that life happens. And challenges come our way. And you will get through them. Honestly, you will get through them and it will pass. So be flexible and know ahead of time that something could and most likely will get in the way of you trying to achieve your dreams. Just don't forget them. Just be flexible and know that sometimes you just got to take a little detour. That's why we started the Stackable Certification Program, was to at least get you to finish a semester and have something to show for that semester, which would be a certificate showing that you finished. Then if something detours you for a semester or two, just don't forget to come back and finish, and finish what you started. It's so important, not to really anybody else, but it's so important to you to finish that goal and get that degree that you first started. Next is to find your passion. Once you have that passion for something, um, you thrive because you do everything in your power to learn, research, and be the best at whatever it is, is your, which is your, it's your passion. Does anybody have a passion in here for something? Come on, somebody's gotta have a passion, yes. Motorcycles. Motorcycles, okay, he has a passion for motorcycles. I would imagine you love the smell of the, when the engine is running and you love that sound of it coming down the street or going over the hills. It's just, you love that. Doesn't matter who's doing it, it drives you. You probably know more about motorcycles than most motorcycle salesmen. And so when I'm talking to people in interviews, I kind of lead it a little, little bit differently sometimes and I'll go, tell me your passion. And what is it that drives you? 
And sometimes what's so wonderful is when you can find a career around that passion. Wouldn't that be awesome? Think of what makes you just thrive inside. And wouldn't it be awesome to have a job and a career surrounded around that? And sometimes it may even be starting your own business, doing something like that. So that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, so next, never stop learning. It's probably one of my favorites. Um, after college, I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to be a lot harder to get into a class like this that you're in, okay? Um, but you must find ways to continue your lifelong education because just because you graduate doesn't mean that class is over. Continue to take classes, attend seminars, attend webinars, continue your personal development. It's no one's responsibility but your own that you continue your development in life. I'm sure your professor continues her own education. I'm sure that many other people um, in the workplace, and I can guarantee you that they do, continue to, uh, in their education in life, whether it be in their profession, in their passion, or whatever the case may be, but just keep learning. I personally have an employment law seminar next week, and I've already attended two this year, but the employment law situations change so often, I've got to constantly stay up to date on them. So never stop learning. Your career will depend on it. And with Rocky Mountain Power, one of our goals is that you have two developmental goals set throughout the year, whether it's classes or whatever the case may be, but you get and continue your own education. And um, so with that um, comes the next one, is to create a work-life balance. Is it difficult going to school and working at the same time? Is it difficult having a family and working and going to school at the same time? All these things in life start weighing on our plate. And I always, I always like to bring back the analogy that I have this plate full of spaghetti and meatballs. And my meatballs fall off my plate quite often, I'll admit, because I, I struggle sometimes balancing the work and the life um, situations. And so I have to constantly work at it. Work can become so demanding that your entire focus and your life were, revolves around work, or your personal life may become so overwhelming it overshadows your daily existence and makes it difficult to do anything else. Um, somehow you've got to find that balance. Speak to a mentor, speak to a professor, speak to a counselor, speak to mom. Sometimes that just helps to call mom or dad or just your best friend, someone to help you find balance. It took somebody telling me, Carrie, you work way too many hours and your family is suffering because of it. And that is not my goal in life. So I had to readjust myself. Find that balance and somehow try to find it weekly between work and your personal life. And remember that no one ever dies wishing they spent more time at work. I'll be honest with you. I hope that learning a little bit about my journey uh, through my life and with my challenges and successes would inspire you and to help you meet your challenges and that this is a learning experience and most importantly, appreciate those moments of success. And give yourself a pat on the back. It's okay to do that once in a while. When you pass that test, you turn in those four papers she's talking about. I'm glad it's you and not me. And so um, I just know what that's like. And when you do that, give yourself a pat on the back. Go get a milkshake. Go get a hot fudge sundae. Go ride that motorcycle because you deserved it. How did I pay for my schooling? So coming from the environment I came from, um, school actually going to, uh, you know, into a formal education was not something that was encouraged for girls in the 60s. I know I'm talking a little past, you know, a little archaic, but it's true. Um, it was just not something. And when I told my family I was going to go get a degree, they went, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to spend that much money? I said, because I'm worth it. 
and my family is worth it, and you are worth it. So I found a way, and I did the FAFSA loans, um, worked through those, and worked diligently to pay them off. Don't skip those <laughs> loans. But that's how I did it through uh, Salt Lake Community College, was the FAFSA loans, I'll be honest. And it worked for me, and I was diligent in paying those off. With Western Governors, Rocky Mountain Power helped me, but I was making enough money that I budgeted right into my home budget schooling. And so I set aside certain amount every paycheck that would go towards my next tuition coming up. And at the time, it was about $2,500 a term, and a term was six months, so I had to come up. I knew that in the next six months, I'm going to have to have $25 ready to write a check. What did I say? Oh, $2,500. And so I just knew that I had to come up with that, but I, I kind of set myself a goal to do that. And that's how I paid for my education. Number one mistake. I would say it's arrogance. Um, a lot of times they come in, I've literally had someone say, you know, when they sat down and, so tell me a little bit about yourself. And they asked me a question. And then the next question is, so I'm here so that someday I can have your job. And it's like, really, that's not how you want to start an interview. And because um, I like my job, and maybe you know, someday you could work to get this position, but at the moment I hold this position. Let's talk about the position you're applying for. Um, <clears throat> sometimes it's, it's that sense of arrogance that, why am I getting through all these questions? Why are you asking me these? This is bogus. <laughs> Let's move on to the meat. And it's like, well, this is the meat. Answer the questions, please. And so that's one of them. Um, another one might be uh, just body language, to be honest with you. I, I, we sat down with a gentleman who had great answers. The answers were perfect, but he kept looking at his clock. He kept chewing his gum, and he kept readjusting his coat, and it was just... I, I was paying more attention to his body language than his words. So your body language speaks volumes about the position. I could tell he was nervous, and I felt that he just wanted to get the heck out of there. But he, hands down, word-wise, was great. And so it was really difficult for the interview panel to make a decision, but honestly, we didn't hire him. And uh, we just felt he had a, another agenda. And actually, that is a question that many of our managers like to ask. What did you do to prepare for this interview? And so I thought about that question myself. Uh, one of the first things I would do is, first of all, know that job description. Know it very well. Think of yourself in the job on a daily ba basis. Even though you're not there, you know what you're applying for. You know what it requires. You know a little bit of the responsibilities Check out that job description, print it out, read it over and over, okay? Number one, read your job description of the position you're applying for. Number two would be to research the company. You might want to know a little bit about the company. And please, don't give me the little verbatim that we have online. I hear it all the time. I hear that first paragraph. Well, I want to work for Rocky Mountain Power because they're the leading uh, utility company in the Western United States, and you supply power to over you know, 8 million homes, and it's like, really? Um, that's on our website. <laughs> okay, don't read me what I've already put on the website. Tell me what you learned about the company. What do you know? And why do you want to work for us? What's your, what's your interest in working for us? Hey, I'd like to work for Rocky Mountain Power because I want to be a part of the team that keeps these lights on. Cha-ching. Such a simple answer listen to our ads, <laughs> and that might help too. So preparing yourself for the interview, uh, those, those are some great things to know. Also, think about, um, I've had people come into the interview before just sweating. I'll be honest, and I can tell because they're just, you know, they're sweating and they're nervous, and we're all nervous. I get nervous going into interviews, and I'm not even being interviewed. I'm giving the interview, but I get nervous for the person. So one time this, this lady was really, I thought she was going to pass out. So I said, you know, there's a restroom right around the corner. You just go put a little bit of cold water on your wrist and just sit there for a minute and calm down, relax, think about what you're doing, and think about, hey, 
I'm just here to interview them. <coughs> you are interviewing them. And think about it that way. You're answering questions, but you had but better have a question in mind for them. So throughout the course of the interview, be thinking about a question you have, because you know you've got a question. A lot of people say, so what does this job entail on a daily basis? And I say, well, I don't know. I'm not in that job. I couldn't tell you. I just know a little bit about every position in this company, enough to get you in this door and in this interview. So does that help? A few, few ideas there. I probably could go on and give a whole lesson on that one question. <laughs> so, but thank you for that uh, question. That's right, and that is one of the main reasons why I, I went with Western Governors. Um, they are an accredited university, they are recognized, and I run background checks, and when I do an education verification, which I do all the time, Western Governors comes up. There are several universities, I'm sad to say, that people have gone to that I cannot accept <clears throat> their bachelor's degree, and that's really sad. So Western Governors is an accredited university. I registered. Um, there was somebody that, actually it was through, I was judging for DECA, and one of the judges mentioned that he was going to Western Governors and uh, how much he was enjoying it, how hard it was, but how much he was enjoying it. And I said, and I asked him a little bit more, and he goes, yeah, just give him a call, and if you mention that you heard it from me, um, you will save the $60 application fee. So try it. If you're going to apply for Western Governors, say, Carrie Raditz referred me to you. I hear I can get uh, savings on my application fee. And basically what they'll do is set you up with a mentor, first of all, to see if you are qualified to enter the university. So you have to go through an interview on the phone. They're going to ask you about your computer setup. They're going to ask you about your learning habits and your study habits. And how are you going to do this? Because believe me, you have got to be so incredibly disciplined. You don't come to a classroom like this. I never sat in one classroom. My classroom was my kitchen table late at night with my laptop, and that was my classroom. But the wonderful thing was that if I ever had a question or a problem, I had an economics class that, my goodness, I could not understand what I was reading. And I finally just, my, and I called my mentor and she said, Tomorrow, what time are you available? I had a full hour with that economics professor on the phone with a whiteboard on my laptop for a full hour. And after 45 minutes, I was done. She goes, well, you've got 15 more minutes. What else do you want to talk about? This was my economics professor. I, where do you get that? Other, I mean, Salt Lake Community College is grand and wonderful, too. And you can have one-on-ones with your professors. Um, and so I really appreciated that because that helped me pass that economics class as well as my marketing class was probably one of the most difficult classes. So um, another thing that they provide for you is your own mentor. You will be assigned a mentor somewhere in the United States. This mentor checks in on you weekly. How you doing? Any troubles you're having? Do you need to speak to a, a mentor do you, or a professor? Do you need any kind of resource assistance? And at one time, I even was having some struggles at home. She put me in touch with a, a, a work-life balance, school balance counselor. And I went, wow, <laughs> this is awesome. I said, how much is this going to cost? She said, it's paid for with your tuition. So they were interested in not only my passing, but they were interested in me as a human being and as an individual. And they understood where I was in my life. And they took that into consideration. There was a period of time where um, I needed a break. And she said, let's give you three months. And because you go every six months. So if you go January to June, your next term starts July 1. So if you go till June 30th, your next term starts July 1. And uh, you just keep going until you are done. They set up your courses for you. You don't have to, they do it all for you. It's all lined up. You don't have to wait for a class to open for the next semester to be a night class or day class. It's there, available for you to take when you're ready to take it. Oh, and the other thing is you have to have 12 credit units, but that's your tuition for that 12 credit units. Once you pass those 12 credit units of those classes, you can take additional classes for free. I was able to, okay, ready? 
I was able to do 31 credit units in one term in six months. I didn't have a family during that six months. They still love me, but I did it and I finished and that was when I graduated. But it was also part of my PHR. So my family knew I had a daughter who got married and right after it I started and went and I did not stop for six months. But I got through 31 credit hours, but I only paid for the 12. So anyway, does that help? Some information about Western Governors University when you finish with your associates? First thing I look at is, are they applying for the right job? I will look at a resume uh, for an engineer, and I'm going, this person is a project manager. What are they doing applying for my engineer? I can clearly see that all they have is project managing experience, and one of the requirements states that uh, it requires an engineering degree. So that's the first thing I do. I really quickly kind of look through, and I look, I don't do a keyword thing. I don't know how a recruiter could do that. They say that they look at keywords, look for keywords. I look at every single resume, I read through them, and so that's what I'm looking for real quickly is does this person match what I'm looking for requirement-wise? I do a real quick assessment of their education requirements, and I do a real quick assessment of the years of experience they've had doing what I'm looking for. Does that make sense? Okay, so for an engineer, for example, I've got one that I'm trying to squeak in from the associate level into a mid-level. He's only got about a year's of experience, but so I started looking back and I went, where's the rest of your resume? I knew he had an internship, but he hadn't put it on his resume, so I called him. So where's the rest of your resume? Uh, I need that experience on there. Don't leave experience off. You just never know what they will need to get you the experience level that you need for that position. I've also been able to take people who applied for a mid-level and make them a senior because they qualified at the senior level. So I'm, I'm real quickly looking for, do you meet the requirements for the position? So anywhere you can put that right up at the top, that's great. <laughs> so in the job description, it will say what the responsibilities are, but look down in those requirements. Usually in the first three to four bullets, in the requirements of a job description, they'll tell you what we're looking for. Every time I look at you know, a whole list of resumes, real quickly I'm gonna look at that job description first. Because I, I look at you know, positions all day long, I've gotta make sure I'm hiring, you know, looking at candidates for the right job. I'm gonna read that job description and I keep it up on one monitor, and then on the other monitor I have my resumes. And I'm quickly assessing, do they meet those requirements? Then I go back and I read the whole thing. And then I make a quick assessment, yes or no. And so basically recruiters are your gatekeeper. You gotta go through them, and it, just plain and simple. Most companies, if they have a recruiter, you, it, you just gotta go through that recruiter. And um, that's basically what we do. When I've got literally 75 applicants for one position, I'm not gonna send all 75 applicants to the manager. I'm gonna hopefully just send him or her five. I'm gonna try to narrow it down to the best applicants I can find. So that's what I look for on a resume. First off is, do you meet the requirements for the position? And then yes, yeah, some are, are really nice and how they're set up, but um, don't leave off dates on your resumes. Chronologically, I need to see the years of experience you have, so I am quantifying your skills as well. Does that make sense? Okay, my, my answer to that is, if you, um, she asked, how many years should I go back on a resume? And on a resume, it, it's difficult if you've got like 20 plus years listed to go back and put everything unless it is relevant to the position. If you've been in the same position for 20 years, you're gonna be able to list that. But if you've had job after job after job, if it's not relevant, take it off. If it was working for different companies and I had one person applying for a project manager and he put everything he had been doing, um, I can't remember what it was, but it was a different, totally different field in consulting, that's what it was. It had nothing to do with project managing. He should have just taken that off. I didn't need to see all that. So 
If it's relevant to the job, keep it on there. If it's not, take it off. So his question was about gaps. And what about leaving gaps on your resume? And that is, that is a problem, because I'll have managers come back and ask me, <clears throat> this person hasn't worked for three years. What was their problem? What are they trying to hide? So to avoid that, go ahead and put it on there. If it's in the middle and you need to show what was down here on your resume, but in the middle you had like a three-year gap, go ahead and put the, list the company, list your title, and the dates you worked there, move on. Sometimes the title will be very evident if you were in the food service industry and you were a server. That's very evident to me, you were still working. I had a gentleman who was an engineer and had run on some bad luck and for two years went to work for DI or Deseret Industries. And um, I had pulled that out of there and I was testing a manager and I pulled it out of there. And he asked me, where's the gap? And I said, I'll show you the resume, but I want you to look at the experience and know that he qualifies. He said, okay, so I showed him and he went, oh, I see why you did that. And I wanted to make sure that they were not being biased because of any kind of gap um, or any kind of issues or where they were, doesn't matter. If you meet the requirements for that position, that's what matters. So you, but you gotta show it. Don't leave it off, even if it was between a gap period. Do you see what I'm saying? So if you worked two years down here and then got laid off and couldn't find something in your field, you had to do something, whether it be food service or you know, whatever the case may be, you did something, fill it in, put the dates, move on, and this is what I'm applying for now. But as long as you meet those requirements, that's, that's crucial. Okay, all right, thank you very much.